My name is Elizabeth Folkman, and I'm an adult rheumatologist at the University of California, Los Angeles, where I care for patients who have autoimmune interstitial lung diseases. So let's talk about a case. And before we do, I just want to give some background on fibrosing interstitial lung diseases. These encompass a number of diverse conditions overlapping in their clinical presentations, imaging, and histopathological patterns. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, is the prototype of a fibrosing ILD, meaning that this is a type of ILD that generally progresses or gets worse over time. But you can see that a significant proportion of patients with other ILDs will develop a progressive fibrosing phenotype. And these are listed here in these circles. So it includes things like chronic fibrotic HP, sarcoidosis, as well as connective tissue disease related ILD. I'm delighted to share with you the learning objectives for today. The first one is to identify the signs and symptoms of progressive pulmonary fibrosis, or PPF, to improve diagnosis in accordance with updated guidelines. The second objective is to apply strategies to improve communications with and education of patients with newly diagnosed progressive pulmonary fibrosis. This has been an area where historically there's been a lot of different terminology to describe this clinical phenotype in the literature. So people have used the term progressive fibrosing ILDs. They've also used the term ILDs with the progressive fibrosing phenotype, chronic progressing fibrosing ILDs, et cetera. And historically, there's been no unifying definition. In fact, in clinical trials, various criteria have been used to describe this phenomenon of progressive fibrosing ILD. But finally, in May of 2022, an international society practice guideline was published that provided unified terminology. And they termed the term progressive pulmonary fibrosis and basically provided a consensus definition with both radiological, physiological, as well as symptomatic criteria to define PPF. So this was the definition that was proposed in this consensus statement. And this applies to a patient with ILD of known or unknown etiology other than IPF. And to meet the criteria for PPF, patients have to have two of the following three criteria within the past year with no alternative explanation. So the first one is worsening respiratory symptoms. The second is physiological evidence of disease progression. So it could be either an absolute decline in the FVC greater than or equal to 5% or an absolute decline in the DLCO corrected for hemoglobin greater than or equal to 10%. And the third one is radiological evidence of disease progression, one or more of the following listed here. Experts have proposed specific diagnostic algorithms for ILDs that may develop into progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So the first step is to perform a comprehensive evaluation, and this includes clinical assessment, pulmonary function tests, HRCT, serological evaluation, and some may even do a bronchoscopy to evaluate the BAL fluid. The next step is the multidisciplinary discussion. And in this step, patients are given a diagnosis or a working diagnosis, and some patients at this step may be labeled as unclassifiable ILD. And these are patients that may require additional testing like surgical lung biopsy, additional bronchoscopy with BAL to further classify their ILD. Following the MDD, patients either receive treatment or they're monitored closely with this watch and wait approach. But all patients need to undergo close monitoring for disease progression with serial clinical assessment, pulmonary function testing, and follow-up HRCT. This will allow you to determine the disease behavior and ultimately figure out if the patient meets the criteria for a progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So in terms of the clinical course, patients can progress even when they receive treatments. And oftentimes, some patients can even mirror the clinical course of what we see in IPF, where patients have declines in lung function, worsening respiratory symptoms, as well as decline in functional status and quality of life. And this can lead to earlier premature mortality. 
So we've learned from clinical trials on progressive pulmonary fibrosis and IPF that declines in pulmonary function are associated with mortality. So this slide demonstrates declines in the FVC in the inbuild and impulsus trials, two trials that were looking at patients with ILD with a progressive fibrosing phenotype. And in these studies, you can see that a substantial proportion of patients had declines in their FVC. And those patients who had a relative decline in FVC greater than 10% had a much increased risk of death. So uh, the hazard ratio in the inbuilt trial was 3.64, and in the impulses trial, the hazard ratio was 3.95. So this represents a between three to four fold increased risk of death in those patients who are having this decline in lung function. Let's move into a case, and this is a patient of mine, a 41-year-old African-American female who presented to me initially in November of 2021. And the patient reported that in January of the previous year, she had developed Raynaud phenomenon, four months later developed dyspnea, and then in October of 2020 developed acid reflux disease and went to her PCP who noticed that she had some tight skin across her chest and referred her to a rheumatologist. So by December 2020, she had been referred to a rheumatologist who diagnosed her with systemic sclerosis and started her on mycophenolate. She came to see me in November 2021, so almost a year after her initial diagnosis. And her symptoms at that time, including skin tightness, dyspnea, heartburn, as well as fatigue. On physical examination, she had bibasilar crackles. She had hyperpigmentation of her hands and forearms. And her modified Rodin skin score, MRSS, was 25. And this is the way that we objectively assess the extent of skin involvement in patients with systemic sclerosis. And this would indicate a fairly high skin score for a patient and also indicate that she has diffuse cutaneous sclerosis. So the patient underwent laboratory studies and was found to have a positive ANA at a titer of 1 to 320. And we generally see positive ANAs in our patients with systemic sclerosis. We also checked her for a number of other scleroderma-specific autoantibodies that are listed here, like the SCL70 antibody and the RNA polymerase 3 and anticentromere. All of those antibodies were negative for this patient. She had a mild anemia with a hemoglobin of 11.5, and both her ESR and CRP were elevated. And these are generalized markers for inflammation that can be high in some patients with scleroderma, particularly early in the course of their disease. In terms of her pulmonary function test, I didn't have the percent predicted values from her previous provider, but you can see that from May to July, she was experiencing a slight decline in her FVC and DLCO. When she came to see us, we got CT imaging, and she was found to have an NSIP pattern of fibrosis radiologically on our HRCT. And you can see here on the left arrow that she had reticulation, these fine white linear opacities that represent fibrosis or scarring in the lung parenchyma. She also had ground glass opacity, which is represented here by the right arrow, which demonstrates this kind of gray hazy opacity where you can still see the blood vessels through the space. And this, we think, represents interstitial inflammation. This patient had demonstrated that despite treatment with mycophenolate, she was still having progression of her ILD. So we discussed adding another therapy, and given that this patient had elevated inflammatory markers, we wanted to escalate her immune therapy. So we discussed adding something like rituximab versus tocilizumab, and we ultimately decided with the patient and myself making the decision together that rituximab was a better choice for her. This was in part because the patient's skin disease was getting worse um, despite treatment with mycophenolate, and studies have demonstrated that rituximab can improve skin disease in patients with diffuse scleroderma. 
So the patient started rituximab in January of 2022. And then upon follow-up PFTs that we got a month later, she had had stability in her FVC and DLCO. And I've continued to follow her since this time. And she's had continued improvement in her skin disease and stability in her pulmonary function in terms of her ILD. So in terms of this case, this patient is what I would consider to be a rapid progressor. So this patient was diagnosed with ILD within one year of developing her ray nod phenomenon symptoms. Right away, this is a sign that this patient likely has a more serious phenotype of not only her ILD, but also her systemic sclerosis. Both her ESR and CRP were elevated, and this again is a sign of someone that is likely to have progression of ILD and potentially skin disease as well from the systemic sclerosis. In addition, her initial PFTs demonstrated severe restrictive physiology. So sometimes early in the course of ILD, patients can have normal PFTs. But actually, in this patient, she already had developed severe restrictive physiology even upon her initial pulmonary function testing. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is even though this patient was rather promptly started on mycophenolate, again, which is considered the first line treatment for our scleroderma-related ILD, she had no improvement in her lung function. And this is why it's so important to monitor these patients closely because not everyone will respond to that first line therapy and patients may need to have changes in their therapy over time. So in terms of multidisciplinary discussion, when it comes to this case, even though her diagnosis was clear in the sense that she had diffuse systemic sclerosis, the MDD can be very helpful in establishing treatment plans or even changing treatment plans for patients. So the core MDD participants may include pulmonologists, rheumatologists, radiologists, and pathologists. But other participants may include respiratory therapists, psychologists, as well as social workers. And studies have demonstrated that there are a number of benefits of the MDD when it comes to caring for patients with ILD. So this could include increased diagnostic confidence by refining a provisional diagnosis, increased diagnostic precision, as well as enhanced inter-observer agreement on the diagnosis. Patient education is also a cornerstone for caring for patients with progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And surveys of patients with IPF, a progressive form of ILD, have found that information about disease progression and what to expect is at the top of the list of educational needs. Patients express that they want to do their own research and use preferred websites as their primary means of acquiring disease-related information. But there have been concerns about where to find trustworthy information, and recent studies have found that information on the internet is often inaccurate, incomplete, and outdated. And I have found that in caring for patients with systemic sclerosis-related ILD, that many of the reports on patients' life expectancy and mortality come from studies that were conducted many years ago before we had approved therapies for treating them. But there are some reliable resources available that provide patient-centered information on progressive pulmonary fibrosis, and they include the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, as well as Pinpoint Pulmonary Fibrosis, and the websites are listed here. Another reflection on this case is that rapid progressors have a small window of time to intervene before they experience irreversible loss of lung function. So these patients should be referred promptly to expert scleroderma centers or ILD centers. And treatment changes are needed as early as six months if no appreciable response to initial therapy is observed. Close monitoring of these patients at least every three months is paramount to ensuring that they're responding to treatment, and if they're not, that they receive alternate treatment. I want to thank you for your time today. Please remember to complete your post-test and evaluation for CME credit. Thank you to Beringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals, Inc. for providing the educational grant to support this program. And please visit this website here, pilotforpulmonary.org, for more CME opportunities.